Okay, let's uh, let's make a start. People will sort of come wandering in as uh, as the evening uh, progresses, as uh, usual. Um, welcome everyone to the uh, March uh, 2022 uh, meeting at the Mornington Peninsula uh, Astronomical Society. Um, to begin with, uh, a couple of things uh, shown on the first slide here, uh, not the least being the giraffe in the top uh, right hand side. Uh, in the last month uh, we actually saw um, uh, a, uh, a small uh, asteroid, uh, it was only um, about half the size of this room. Um, uh, maybe even less, uh, came in and uh, landed in the ocean uh, off uh, Iceland. It was heard and seen as it came in and there was two hours warning. Now the video um, of the, uh, the grainy image at the top there uh, is not, not playing for some reason. It um, uh, actually shows um, the, uh, the asteroid sort of moving uh, slowly up uh, the screen. As I say, uh, between the time of discovery, that asteroid 2022 EB4, as they called it, um, uh, was uh, given two hours warning as it came in, which obviously was not enough to do anything if it had been uh, something a bit, uh, a bit larger and nastier. Uh, it was picked up in a uh, 60 centimetre uh, telescope in uh, Hungary uh, by uh, Christian uh, Sonecki. And, um, it was uh, interestingly uh, in when, when they announced it to the world they didn't say it was about three to four meters uh, across they actually said it was half the size of a giraffe and uh, that's why they showed the giraffe uh, in all the press releases around the world uh, obviously uh, they, they figure there are more people out there that under, understand what the size of a giraffe is than what the size of uh, uh, three to four meters is that's right how old is a giraffe uh, down in the bottom right hand side there, um, this uh, was a discovery from almost a year ago but it's only just come to light and uh, been published. It was a PhD student from Curtin University, had been uh, playing around with artificial intelligence and uh, had picked up um, an incoming uh, uh, meteor on the, uh, the desert uh, network, uh, yeah, desert fireball network and uh, immediately uh, set to work trying to find uh, the uh, object that came in and uh, what they did was they went to uh, approximately the location the, uh, the, the, the camera network across uh, the deserts uh, show and then they sent up a drone to actually map out the area they took all the drone image uh, back uh, to the university and ran it through AI that they've been training up to try and identify meteorites as opposed to uh, rocks uh, that are out there and lo and behold it uh, found um, uh, within four days of the fall, so very, very uh, quickly, um, something that is much, much smaller than a Sharpie. So you see uh, the, the text of there in terms of size. And uh, the drone footage actually uh, managed to pick that up. So it's believed that that's a carbonaceous chondrite, so possibly like the Murchison meteorite, that, that sort of one, but um, they're yet to uh, analyse it. Uh, although they probably have, but it's uh, just not uh, come out yet. So, it's only 70 grams, so really, really small, and to be picked up from the air sort of shows the promise of being able to find it. And in fact, um, the researchers said that ordinarily they would not have been able to find that uh, previously, uh, even if they'd been searching for weeks and weeks. It was just too small and uh, too hard to actually find, so the AI actually mm -hmm. uh, picked it up uh, really, really well. Mm -hmm. So we're working on circumstantial evidence, or are we going to be fairly careful that's a part of that? Maybe. Okay. On the, uh, the bottom right hand side there, we have um, uh, an, obviously a, a globe of the Earth, but this is actually showing the variation of gravity from position to position on the Earth. And this was uh, released a little while ago by uh, NASA. It was a um, collaboration between NASA and the German Space Agency. And uh, there was uh, two satellites, twin satellites, twin match satellites uh, known as GRACE, or the, um, the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Um, Grace actually uh, came to grief uh, a couple of years ago when the battery ran, ran out and died in space, so that was the end of the mission. Uh, pretty much like my laptop uh, last meeting, for those of you who were here my last meeting, my laptop uh, died not because the battery ran out, but because the battery died, <laughs> and that was the end of uh, that, uh, that battery. So what you're seeing on the rotating globe there is the red, so where gravity is higher, uh, higher than the mean and uh, when it goes down to uh, the blues it's uh, lower than the mean so you can see is where Australia comes uh, around it's uh, 
fairly innocuous uh, in the middle and fairly uh, constant across uh, the continent. Now how these uh, two spacecraft, the GRACE uh, satellites work, they look very much like a range hood in your kitchen, that sort of shape, but uh, obviously a bit bigger. And two of them were separated by about 220 kilometres, but they could measure the position of each other to within a micron, <laughs> so, uh, which is uh, a thousandth of a millimetre, so really, really uh, accurately. And uh, what, what, what happened is, uh, as, as they flew over the Earth's surface, mapping it out, one, is one, one of the craft actually leads the other one by 200 odd kilometres, and if it enters a higher gravity field, it speeds up. And the craft measures the increase in the distance between those because of the very, very high accuracy uh, measurement between the two craft. And that's how they were actually able to, uh, to map the entire Earth's surface there, uh, due to differences beneath the surface of uh, composition of what's actually under there. <coughs> so that's great. Okay, so uh, tonight, welcome any, anyone who's new. I don't think uh, there's uh, too many here that uh, are new to the society, maybe, uh, maybe in the last uh, few months. Um, we don't have Merida here tonight by uh, the looks of it, she's still uh, renovating. Uh, I'll go through, uh, as usual, the events that Sadi's uh, done in the last month and what it's doing uh, coming up. Then uh, we have uh, access to a talk that was given by uh, Professor Sandra Faber from the Lick Observatory and uh, University of California, uh, Santa Cruz, who gave a talk uh, um, uh, remotely to uh, Sydney just a couple of days ago, so we've got special permission to actually show that one. And it pretty much uh, talks about um, can humans actually survive and thrive on planet Earth uh, in the longer time scale. So in other words, uh, you know, uh, yeah, assuming that we don't uh, destroy ourselves in a, a much uh, much shorter time scale, so she actually discusses that. She's, she's a bit of a futurist, amongst uh, other things. Then we'll go to uh, Sky for the Month with uh, Mark, and then afterwards uh, a couple of uh, short videos. One goes for about 12-13 uh, minutes, how the James Webb Telescope orbits nothing. I mentioned this at, uh, during last uh, month's meeting, that where the James Webb Telescope is out at the L2 Lagrange point, sort of uh, further out um, from the moon than uh, the, the moon is itself, uh, it's actually in orbit. It's not actually sitting there in space uh, in a single point. It actually orbits around uh, an empty point. And then the question is, how can something orbit around nothing? So in other words, there's no planet there with gravity to actually cause it to orbit. It's actually orbiting around uh, nothing there. And the orbit, I think, takes several months to go around uh, once but it nevertheless uh, orbits around it. So that, that video explains all that, how that can be. Then uh, a short one uh, by uh, a European Space Agency astronaut uh, talking about um, how uh, colds and flu are handled in space and what they, uh, they do up on the International Space Station, at least for as long as we have the International Space Station. And um, then uh, a little bit of a fun one, uh, how to measure the speed of light using marshmallows given by a, uh, a physicist uh, from George uh, Washington uh, University, and anyone could do that uh, in their kitchen. And uh, lastly, because Easter's coming up, we will uh, look at how to make a chocolate telescope, and I'd have to say it's a pretty, uh, pretty impressive one, including with optics, edible optics, uh, as uh, part of it, so we'll show that right towards the end, uh, before uh, closing. So recent events, um, on the 19th of February, a couple of days after the last uh, monthly meeting, we had the Telescope Learning Day up here at the Briars. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there, um, but uh, others uh, uh, were, and I believe it was uh, a, a very successful uh, afternoon and, uh, and evening. And uh, I didn't hear whether it was clear, but uh, I assume uh, some, some sort of observing was able to be done uh, that evening. Uh, we had a, a committee meeting by Zoom a couple of weeks uh, later. Uh, and uh, some of the key things were to uh, talk about the uh, sundial. I'll show a picture that, uh, that Greg had there of um, the sundial. Uh, you probably passed the uh, big rock on the way in from uh, the car park if you parked at the top there. It's not uh, attached yet, but uh, Greg has been busily beavering away, chipping at that uh, rock. Um, pretty much like a, a prison punishment uh, because it takes <laughs> many, many hours because uh, it's a very, very solid rock. And um, this was uh, one that was donated by Ian Sullivan many years ago to uh, the Society and uh, we finally got around to actually putting it up and then the challenge will be to mount it at the correct angles so that the times uh, will be uh, accurate. 
because uh, this sundial is uh, corrected for the position of the bras. So you can see the analemic connection, that direction down the bottom there, that wavy, swivy line, that shows you, depending on the date, what the time correction is, and you should be able to um, get the time accurate to within a few tens of seconds at worst um, with that uh, correction, if it's, if it's all mounted very well, so that will be a bit of a challenge. The next day, on the 3rd of March, we went out to Point Leo, a bit of a change of venue at the last moment uh, due to uh, the school uh, shifting. Um, this was uh, Strathcona Girls Grammar, we've uh, done viewing nights for them uh, before. Had 42 pupils and uh, absolutely no cloud. They had a wonderful evening, uh, saw the Chinese space station come over, a nice bright pass on the International Space Station. And it was nice and uh, windy as well, so no issues with COVID blowing around or anything uh, like that. So um, it was uh, a, a good, uh, good turnout there. I think they were very happy. The uh, next night we had Trevor giving a, a talk on, um, on the 4th of March here at the Bryce for the public, uh, public night. And he gave away a couple of uh, meteorites as well for the uh, people lucky enough to come to that. 100% uh, clouds, so that kept uh, some people away and we also had some drop out uh, due to um, uh, potential COVID infection as well and that's just going to be a fact of life. So coming up soon, we've got a uh, fair few here uh, this weekend. I assume there will be a, a working bee and uh, members night at the Bryce. Yeah, not at the back there. Uh, no need to book for any of that, just uh, turn up. And um, all you have to do is QR code, uh, check yourself in. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not um, the, the government's actually using those QR codes at the moment, but the uh, committee will, uh, will delve into that uh, subsequently. Um, a couple of days later will be committee meeting by Zoom. Any financial member of the society is welcome to dial in and uh, listen in to uh, the committee meetings that we have. And I usually post out those details and I forget. Next big one coming up on the 26th of March is uh, the musical Stargazing Trivia Night that um, David Rolf has been uh, kindly organising with the Cranbourne Lions uh, concert band. They'll be here at the Bryce. So it'll be a bit of uh, live music and uh, stargazing outside. Now booking is definitely necessary for that. Uh, we've got 65 books so far. I'm not sure if that's maxed out yet, um, but um, if you wish to come, uh, yeah, you definitely have to uh, book for that. Trevor will, will be uh, talking at uh, that particular uh, event. Uh, 1st of April, public stargazing night at the Bryce. Um, we will probably be booked to our our comfortable capacity. I think, strictly speaking, we could probably fill the room to 100 if we wish to, but um, uh, people will get uh, somewhat nervous even at the moment with the, uh, the Omicron second strain uh, doing the rounds. 6th of April, we're down to uh, the old guides camp at uh, Camp Aluka down at uh, Shoreham for a uh, visiting primary school. They booked us over a year ago, so they were really, really keen the last time we talked to them. And uh, we definitely need some uh, help uh, with that one. Um, a couple of days later on the Friday night, we've got the, uh, the Scout Cups and Guys night here at the Briars. So far we don't have any bookings, so this night will be cancelled if we don't get any bookings uh, from Scouts. So that's a case of keep, keep an eye on the email group and, uh, <coughs> and um, see if uh, any message comes out saying the night is uh, cancelled. Yes, Ray? That's 6th of April. Camp Aluka. Is that a different camp to the one we went to a couple of weeks ago? Yes, it's a different camp. Yeah, but this one's insurer. Uh, I think it's not far from the maze that uh, is insurer from memory. There's a, there's a big, uh, big rose maze, or at least there used to be uh, in the years ago. Uh, 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 16th of April, the ASV is the host uh, this year. Is, they're hosting uh, the, uh, the NASA, or the National Australian Convention of Amateur Astronomers. Uh, communication of that will probably come out uh, in the next uh, week or two, uh, fingers crossed. Uh, it's going to be split over two days. Normally it's a face-to-face -face, uh, convention or conference for amateurs to uh, get together from across Australia and it's hosted by different societies around the country that varies from one, uh, one nation to the next. Uh, this time because of COVID and the risk of um, losing deposits and, and everything else if, um, if, if uh, you're having to isolate or quarantine, it was uh, decided to have everything online and I'd say the ASV is very well equipped for running um, online mm -hmm. video conferencing given they've got a uh, professional videographer there as well. And so uh, that promises to be uh, an excellent thing. It's going to be free. So all you need to do is actually log into the URL once we find the URL. 
uh, go to that link and uh, you can watch it from uh, the privacy of your own home. It'll be a series of talks during the day and, uh, and possibly workshops uh, as part of it as well. And you just select which ones uh, you wish to, uh, to go in on and which ones you don't. So details hopefully will come out soon. The second day is on the 23rd of April and uh, so it's, uh, it's split over a week there. So one is during Easter and one is the, uh, the week after Easter. And then down the bottom we actually have a, a new gig that we're uh, in, the, uh, the festival out at Emu's Plains, which is the Balnarring race course, I believe, on Coulart Road. And um, that will be an all day thing. So a bump in in the morning and we'll be there all day and all evening and then a bump out uh, 10 p.m. at night. So we'll need members with telescopes there. We're anticipating maybe 10 to 11,000 people during the day. So there's going to be an awful lot of people there. And um, the, uh, the local council, as well as the Victorian state government are really pushing this hard. So they expect a lot of people to be there. It'll be a bit like, um, there'll be two large music stages there because there's going to be live music throughout that time. There'll also be um, uh, amusements like at a fairground, I think, as well as uh, all, all the usual things like food and everything. And obviously we're stargazing and during the daytime we'll answer any questions and show interesting things like meteorites and show people the, uh, the sky through uh, solar telescopes. Is that a free event? Um, I, th I don't know at this stage. I've not actually seen advertising yet, so I've only been talking to the organiser of it. And uh, we were actually the first group that they approached, so they were so keen to have stargazing that um, we, we were the very first ones. Yes, Fred? Are you, uh, are you sort of putting up on the store like you did in that cool line? Uh, I think so, yes. We, we, we will have a, um, a marquee and, uh, and tables provided, and there will be 240 volt power provided. Um, but uh, other than that, it's, uh, it's a case of just wait and see uh, for the moment what, uh, what happens. Right, so tonight's talk um, about uh, can humans uh, thrive on the planet Earth in the longer term is uh, given by uh, Professor uh, Sandy Faber. Um, she also received um, the highest uh, science award by President Obama many years ago in uh, the USA as well. So she's uh, very well recognized um, in um, uh, certainly in the United States and uh, this was given at the Sydney Institute for Astronomy just a couple of days ago on the uh, 11th. Now it'll be uh, introduced first of all by Dr. Sam Vaughan from uh, Sydney University and uh, then uh, we will go into the talk. So this talk and the questions afterwards will go for about an hour then we'll uh, move on to Sky for the month and then have as usual a bit of a tea break and then during the tea break, um, you then have the option as to whether or not you wish to uh, chat and socialise amongst yourself, look at the night sky if it clears up miraculously, or uh, come in and, uh, and see the videos. Um, so hi everyone, uh, thanks very much for joining us today. And we're absolutely delighted to welcome um, Professor Sandy Faber from the University of California Santa Cruz and a staff member at Lick Observatory. Sandy's an observational astronomer, um, with a long and storied career with very uh, many amazing discoveries, including the Faber-Jackson relation, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Uh, Sandy received her BA degree in physics from Swarthmore College and a PhD in astronomy from the University of Harvard. She's won numerous prizes uh, from various institutions, including the National Medal of Scientists from, uh, presented by President Barack Obama. Mo uh, most recently, um, Sandy founded the Osterbrook Leadership Program for PhD graduate students in the astronomy, in the astronomy department at U, uh, UCSC. And she's a co-founder of the Fledging Earth Futures Institute, um, which we're going to hear more about shortly. Um, so uh, over to you, Sandy. Great. Thanks so much, Sam. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about the long-term future of human beings on planet Earth I started that way and more recently I'm really impelled to think about the near term as well because if we don't have a successful near term then we won't have a successful long term either. So I, I've been giving this this talk to um, to uh, lay audiences and uh, it starts with a story of what we know <clears throat> about how our planet formed and how we came to be here on it. 
And then the second part of the talk draws some conclusions and looks to the future. So you're all astronomers, and as a result, I'm going to go quickly through the astronomical part, but I think it's important to see the big picture, because that's, that's really what uh, has impelled me to come to this subject in the first place. My background is a cosmologist. All right, so I, I believe in starting video talks with a summary at the, at the front um, to be kind to people who can't sit all the way through. So here's what I'm going to say. We understand Earth's history in broad outline and there were no miracles and we live or die by the laws of physics. The biggest threat to life on Earth that we know of is actually volcanism, but even so, it's probably hundreds of millions of years of future habitability. Our cosmic future is bright and perhaps we are very rare in our galaxy. That's my opinion. I'll tell you why. Uh, we're at a critical moment. Preserving Earth's future is a critical moral decision facing humankind right now. But the problem is that there's no global consensus on three critical issues. We need a viable long-term economic system that isn't predicated on growth. We need to understand the basic principles of managing a society and a society in contact with nature. And we have to have a raison d'etre. We have to agree on why this is important to preserve Earth's long-term future. So at the end, I'm going to talk about ethics and values and where they come from. So these three questions are important. Contemplating Earth's future on cosmic time, which is the niche of the Earth Futures Institute at Santa Cruz and distinguishes it a bit from other futures institutes, namely this emphasis on very, very long term cosmic time. It puts these questions, these three issues into proper perspective and helping to answer them is the goal of our new institute, EFI at UC Santa Cruz. And I'll end up with a few words about its program. So let's, let's talk about the cosmic story for just a minute. Back to 10 to the minus 35 seconds, temperature 10 to the 27th degrees right after the Big Bang. The universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. It generates a kind of Hawking radiation, quantum noise. These fluctuations are the seeds of galaxies at an amplitude of about one part in 100,000. And there's a gravitational instability as space expands. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer, analogous to the, the economic saying that's so familiar to us. So dense regions of space draw in more matter and become galaxies. And it's really helpful for um, people who have never heard this before to see a simulation. So this is my favorite simulation of galaxy formation. It was made by some Japanese several years ago. And uh, I don't know whether it's really quantitatively accurate, but I show it because I think the, the um, graphics are better than any other simulations that I've seen illustrated. So the point here, we're still early in the history of the universe, how chaotic it is, hierarchical clustering is going on. The blue that you see here is gas and stars are forming out of the gas. And the great thing about this simulation is that it really shows the, the stars individually, obviously not true to life. They wouldn't be that bright, but for somebody seeing pictures of galaxy formation for the first time, I think this is really a beautiful simulation. Now, the point is that at early times, of course, their universe is dense and lumps collide with one another very frequently. But because the universe is expanding, it's getting less dense. And this incredibly rapid era of uh, frequent collisions passes and objects become more or less more isolated with time. And the result is that late falling gas falls in and forms disks. And all the stars that were formed previously are thrown into a halo. And this is our standard model for why we have spheroids and disks and galaxies. And um, the size of the spheroid is a measure of 
how much previous clustering a galaxy actually experienced. So very beautiful, I think. Okay, so now why do we believe this? It's because, first of all, galaxies look like this. And we see here some pictures of galaxies taken with Hubble. These are these rotating disks seen face on. And we can see them at different orientations. Some of them are even edge on and convince us that indeed there are flattened rotating systems in these objects. And if we home in on a particularly famous nearby object, um, which happens to be edge on, we see this classic dust lane silhouetted against the bulge. And it's easy to imagine that we live in such a galaxy when we take wide angle pictures of our own sky. This is a picture of the Milky Way from Mauna Kea. Okay, there's another way that we can test this. We just saw a history unfolding galaxy formation. And thanks to Hubble, we can actually look back in time this is the Hubble Deep Field, of course. Um, it's actually, I think, the ultra deep field. 10,000 galaxies here. And as we astronomers all know, we can estimate their distance. We can even make a movie. The Space Telescope Science Institute has made one in which we fly down this corridor of time back into the past and see progressively younger and younger objects. And broadly speaking, the properties of galaxies in these onion slices back in time they agree with our models tolerably well. Okay, now let me just take a little detour here and talk about a company that is dear to my heart. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's called despair.com. And they make posters, tongue in cheek posters here. I'll give you one example, okay? Opportunity, just because your ship came in doesn't mean you're going places. This is an example of what they do. So, some people looking at the Hubble Deep Field with its 10,000 galaxies, contemplating that over the celestial sphere, there are 100 billion of them all together, uh, and we are just one. You might take away the message that astronomy, finding out you really just don't matter. But as you'll see, it's the thesis of my talk today that this is exactly wrong. I'm mentioning this thought in order to come back to it and convince us all that, in fact, the opposite is true and uh, Earth and our galaxy, but a partic particularly Earth, are really remarkable. Okay, so let's continue the story of cosmology and the origin of Earth. We've now made galaxies. Galaxies are where stars form. They form in regions like this, H2 regions. Here's a picture with Hubble of our neighbor in the local group M33. And this is a lovely H2 region. You see the exciting stars in the middle lighting up the birth clouds. So it's easy for us to find places in the universe where stars are forming. Uh, we'd like to study regions like this in more detail. And fortunately, we have one right on our doorstep, practically. And that's the Orion Nebula, the sword here of is not a star, it's a, a cloud of glowing gas. And with Hubble, again, we can enlarge it and observe it at very high detail. And at this magnification, you can just barely see these little black dots here. Many of them are uh, so-called proplids, protoplanetary disks that are silhouetted against the glowing gas clouds. Here's a selection of them that are rather young. These are solar systems in formation. Um, they consist of infalling gas, sometimes it's a shock. Uh, the older they get, the denser the gas gets, and there are dust grains that can be seen in silhouette. And when fully formed, um, that is to say, nascent protosolar systems, you see a central star and a dust a disk of silhouetting opaque gas around it. And why do we know that this is a disk? Because some of these objects are seen edge on, analogous to the edge on galaxies that we were just talking about. So what happens in a disk like this? It's very important that black material starts out as tiny grains 
blown out of supernovae and dying stars. They're sticky. They stick together in space and uh, gradually build larger and larger structures. And it's thought form the cores of rocky plant form rocky planets and the cores of giant planets. So when we're looking at these dark clouds silhouetted in space against the Milky Way and other galaxies, what we're really doing is looking at the stuff, the makings of rocks here on Earth. The Earth has coagulated as a rocky planet. And I love this picture, which sort of sums up this whole cosmic story. We have the rocks in the foreground that make our world, but in the background we see the dust clouds of the Milky Way, which is the stuff where we came from. Beautiful story. All right, so um, we're now, we've now made Earth, and we all as human beings seem to have the same question about Earth. Is Earth rare or is Earth common? So many people think that Earths are common, and this all started with something called the Drake Equation, which tried to estimate the number of detectable intelligent civilizations in the galaxy. And we start with some stars and we multiply by a bunch of factors. There are five factors here. And there are so many stars in the galaxy that if you don't have very many factors, you can predict that there are a lot of Earths. A different view, the rare Earth view, is that um, there are more factors basically. And there are nine factors in this equation. Uh, and I'll just mention one as an example of how you can add factors. This F sub M here is the probability of having a big moon. Why would you care about this? Because it's thought that the gravitational action of the moon on the earth is what stabilizes our direction, our axis of rotation. If we didn't have that, it would wander randomly. And sometimes the axis of rotation would point in the plane of the ecliptic. And just think that over for a moment. What does that do to night and day? Uh, that gives you a really ferocious climate with um, winds, extremely strong winds, flowing between the illuminated and unilluminated hem hemispheres. It's, it's really, you can speculate, but it's not Earth as we know it, that's for sure. So I thought I would sit down and make my own list of all the factors that seem to be important for Earth as we know it. I, I emphasize it's our Earth. And there are a total of 17 here. And I'll just call attention to the two at the bottom, um, which is the need for a magnetic field to shield us from damaging stellar, energetic stellar particles from the sun. Uh, and how do we make this magnetic field? Well, we need the right amount, the right ratio of uranium and thorium to magnesium and silicon in the crust. So actually we've written a paper about this recently. Um, some people here at Santa Cruz, I'm a co-author, and it, it turns out that uh, it's a pretty near miss. If you, if you have too little of this stuff by a factor of two, then the mantle cools off. And when the mantle cools off because of lack of radioactivity, then the core cools off and you don't have the dynamo anymore. But if you have too much uranium and thorium, you're going to have way too much volcanism. So we were estimating within a plus or minus factor of two. It's interesting that uranium and thorium are produced in merging neutron stars. There are process elements like platinum and gold. And the enrichment in the galaxy of those elements is a lot patchier than the enrichment of normal type one and type two supernova elements. And this is observed, there's a proxy for uranium and thorium, it's europium should scale with these two and it's quite patchy, it's variable in the galaxy. And so again, we have another one of these Goldilocks moments, given that this ratio can scatter a lot, isn't it interesting that um, we have the right ratio here on earth. Okay, well, there are 17 terms here. So a possible conclusion is that each has a probability of 0.1, 
pull it out of the air, and there are 10 to the 11 stars in the galaxy, then it turns out that the probability of Earth as we know it is one in a million. So it's not obvious that you need Earth as we know it in order to make intelligent life. But it does say, though, that the Earth we know is, in my opinion, very, very special. And take a little detour here. Um, when we see particularly beautiful, interesting, unusual landscapes on Earth, we are moved to create national parks out of them. And so if Earth is as rare as I think it is, maybe it deserves the status of galactic national park, thinking long-term future of us in the galaxy. All right, well, moving on. <clears throat> uh, the Earth's cosmic future is good. We have a stable, stable solar system. Uh, solar warming will not disturb the climate for another 600 million years or so. Uh, the probability of a nearby super explosion is low. There will be comet and asteroid impacts, and we need to find and divert down to uh, 100 meters in diameter or so. But actually, we're working on this, and I think it's feasible. Ice ages are an inconvenience, but they're not life-threatening. Our species has lived through one already. Uh, it turns out that supervolcanoes are probably the biggest threat. They created this mass extinction back in the Permian. That was 250 million years ago. And um, that needs further study. I mean, I have no idea of how we would mitigate against another Deccan Traps uh, eruption as happened back then. But more, bottom line, not very frequent. And we can probably count on a few hundred million years of habitability ahead. Okay, so let's draw some lessons from cosmology. The first is that we got here according to the laws of physics. We are subject to those laws and must live within them. Now, I'm talking to a bunch of astronomers. This sounds familiar. But when I talk to ordinary audiences, this is actually a new thought. There were no miracles in our past and there will be none in future. There are many, many people on earth who don't believe this. It makes it hard to plan. Okay, earth, second point is, um, earth will provide a livable home for at least 100 million years and maybe longer. In other words, we've been given the gift of cosmic time. Will we use this well or will we squander it? I think this is the message that we bring as cosmologists to our fellow human beings. And the interesting thing is that this is the first generation of human beings to actually know that this is true, that we have the gift of cosmic time, and also to understand that facing it is not going to be easy because, of course, the very wherewithal that we have used as astronomers to come to this epiphany of knowledge, that very wherewithal requires an enormous infrastructure, infusion of resources, and it's that activity that is slowly killing the planet. And now I'm coming to the second half of my talk. So at this critical juncture, there are three things we need to be talking about, but we are not. I'll go through them one by one. Start, starting with what is this number? Okay, well, it turns out that this number, if raised to the power of a million, equals a factor of two. So in other words, if we're contemplating long-term intelligent life on Earth, and we think that we're close to the planetary boundaries today within a factor of two, this is the number that we are allowed to grow annually, our GDP, if you will, in order to stay within a factor of two for a million years. So effectively, what it says is that if you hope to thrive here over a long period of time, you need an economic system, you need an infrastructure system that effectively is static. Now, in contrast, what is this number? 
1.03 to a million is 10 to the 12837. That is capitalism's target 3% growth compounded over a million years. This is the other side of the coin. It makes the obvious point that a capitalist economy with a target of 3% growth cannot go on for very long. So this rosy reassuring picture of capitalism, capitalism is in my radar sites right now. Uh, and I'll give you some quotes. By its nature, it entails a constant process of motion, growth, and progress. Well, yeah, that's true. It has been true. But looking forward, I think we see a different picture. And I'm upset that I cannot find a leading economist who says this, interest and dividends are Ponzi schemes both premised on future growth. Capitalism does not bestow growth as an option. It needs it, it feeds on it, and in so doing is devouring our planet. Famous economist X. The point is, no famous economist X is saying this. Mainstream economists are not considering the long-term viability of the economic system. It is just not mainstream or fashionable in their world. And I'm beginning to talk to him economists and trying to figure out why they think this is this is so, why it's true. It's true that there is a branch of economics called environmental economics, and in fact, um, a couple of them won the Nobel Prize a while ago, but nevertheless, their thinking is not front and center on the uh, editorial pages of leading economic publications. Well, not everybody agrees with me. This is John Bogle, who invented the Vanguard um, no-load mutual fund. He says it's not a Ponzi scheme. scheme. Capitalism is a scheme of free markets. Um, but I claim it's, it's not either or, it can be both. It is a scheme of free markets, and that's a wonderfully efficient allocation system. But it can also be a Ponzi scheme because it depends on growth. Paying interest, I think, depends on growth. And um, the facts bear me out. Uh, here's annual copper production for the last century or so, growing at 3.3% per year exponentially. And that's the consumption side. Here's the, the waste generation side. Plastic waste generation, the red curve, has grown at 7% for 65, past 65 years. Now, there are an amazing number of intelligent people who think somehow that technology is going to save us. We're going to substitute new materials for other materials. But in order to really solve the problem, we have to run this economy and actually have zero growth. In fact, I would say we're in overshoot situation and we need to get smaller. But let that, put that aside for a moment and just imagine <clears throat> having a, a growing economy but no added consumption of material resources. Well, people are studying this. Here's a paper. And these people studied 57 different industries in three categories. And they tried to figure out whether or not that industry was actually dematerializing. And by that they meant they could see in each one of these industries, product was increasing, but was the industry actually consuming less? in the process. And there are two factors that, to consider. One is the technical performance, that is to say the technical efficiency in producing your good, versus the amount of extra good is, that is demanded when the national GDP goes up. And if you have high technical efficiency and low extra demand, you're in a good situation, and that's the orange curves here. And here are the 57 points for the objects, the industries that they studied. And um, there's like a couple things here, computer hardware that almost get to the black line. But by and large, the points don't get to the black line, reflecting the fact that even though there are increases in efficiency, the absolute consumption in our economy over the past uh, 30 years, I think that's what they studied, has gone up. And this is repeated all over the place. Okay, 
So none of these 57 sectors studied is within the dematerializing zone and most are far, far away. <clears throat> so this sort of ends my diatribe on capitalism. Um, the word cloud kind of sums up people's impression of it, I think. Um, money, economics, economy, banking, market, et cetera, et cetera. You have to look really hard in this word cloud to find anything negative. But this, in fact, I think is, is where we are with capitalism and we're reaching the limits of the boundary of the planet. What will happen to investments? What will happen to pension funds? What will happen to endowments? What will happen to the ability to raise, raise money if the growth treadmill that we've been on comes to a halt? So this is thing one. There is no global discussion taking place on the nature of capitalism and where it is taking us. Moving on, now I'm coming to the second subject, which is Earth system models and understanding Earth and how it works with people on it. So there's been a, a lot of progress on Earth system models. Um, here's a little slide that shows you how many new complexities have been added to models over the past 40, 50 years. And they're definitely getting more complex, more complete, and so on. But still largely missing is the crucial interface that we need to worry about, and that's the interface between people and the environment. So this is hard to model, but I call your attention to this really cute little uh, paper called Handy, Human and Nature Dynamical Model in which they just simplified as much as possible. There are only four equations in this model. There are rich people, there are poor people, there's nature and there's wealth. And there's an inequality factor, K, which says if the society produces something new, how much of it do the elite people get and how much of it do the commoners get? So the rich elite, accumulates wealth from the work of everybody else, the commoners. And when there's a crisis, the elite can spend their wealth to buy food and survive longer. That's the key thing. The existence of wealth here introduces a time delay. And now you can run this little model with various values of the coefficients. And it's, it's kind of a chaotic set of differential equations, meaning it can do almost anything and the future is very hard to predict from where you are now. It's unstable. Here's an example of some of the solutions. Um, but there are some lessons that you can draw from this very simple arithmetic. Okay. Two factors oppose a stable equilibrium. One is, as I said, the existence of wealth, which allows elites to ignore the plight of the commoners and deny the prospect of impending doom it creates a time delay. Ultimately, the elites fall because they are depending on the commoners to make things and provide things for them. Um, so that's, that's one factor. The inequality factor in this set of equations is also crucial. As things are set up, if this K factor is bigger than 10, the collapse is inevitable. The commoners starve first, but the elites starve later. The only thing that's not in this model is revolution. <laughs> so before all the commoners starve, something might, else might happen to the elites. The point being though, that we are living on a very, we're, we're living at the margins on a planet that's being stressed. Nature in these models uh, fails at some point to provide necessary materials. Um, and even this little mathematical example, I think has a lot of uh, wisdom in it. So I'll summarize by saying, there's no global understanding of earth as a system for harboring complex intelligent life, including the instabilities that are inherent in a complex socioeconomic system and how to tame them. And since we don't understand that, we don't have 
much notion of what Earth's ultimate carrying capacity for higher organisms is. Intelligent life, let me put it that way, either us or our descendants. And because we don't have that, we lack, I think, a vision of how creative Earth can be in the future. And I'm coming to that in just a moment, hold that thought. So now I'm moving on to the third question, uh, which is why do we care? Why do we care about Earth's future? And to discuss that, we really have to fall back and think about why we care about anything and where our ethics comes from. So again, this is a really important question, I think, on which very, there's no consensus amongst human beings about why we believe in good or bad. A large number of people, if you ask them, would subscribe to something like this. The Ten Commandments. I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, etc., etc. In other words, that right and wrong comes from a source that's external to human beings, a higher source. Now, as time passed, many philosophers, including this one, Immanuel Kant, didn't really believe in God anyway and anymore, but nevertheless thought that somehow moral principles hang there in glowing, flashing neon lights. They're absolute, and you're familiar with his famous saying, the categorical, categorical imperative, do the right thing because it is right. But a new view is coming into focus, and it's really stimulated by this very, very profound realization of Darwin, which, whose repercussions are still being felt, I think. And that is that we are a product of evolution. And evolutionary biologists and evolutionary psychologists take a different view of the origin of our ethics. They think that they were honed in natural selection. And here's a quote from a famous leader in this field who just passed away not too long ago, E.O. Wilson. <clears throat> most agree that ethical codes have arisen by evolution. That is to say, most people like me, most evolutionary biologists, agree that um, they have arisen by evolution through the interplay of biology and culture. Cooperative individuals generally survive longer and leave more offspring. So, yes, I agree with this. Going a little bit further, the function of morality, or the moral organ, as some call it, is to negotiate the inherent serious conflict between self and others. And I would say, more and more moving into the future, between self and nature. We have to put nature as part of the others. So a pragmatic tool for decision making. Now, that's still rather abstract. Why do we cave in? Why do we uh, listen to our ethical principles? What's, what's the carrot? What's the stick? And uh, some evolutionary biologists think that the stick really and the carrot are the feelings we have that compel compliance. So this is a evolutionary biologist from South Africa, Mark Solms. He says, evolutionary forces are communicated at the level of the individual organism in the form of feelings, the good feelings associated with functions necessary for survival is what motivates us to do them. And by the way, people have done MRI scans on people and animals and realize that these feelings, at least some of them originate in the lower brainstem and animals like alligators have them too, uh, makes you think that perhaps our thought that we are more ethical, more moral, more sophisticated, more complex than the animals we evolved out of is completely wrong. Maybe we're just at one end of a spectrum and maybe other animals feel regret 
sadness, et cetera, et cetera, just as we do, because they have to make decisions also. They need a pragmatic decision-making tool. Why do we think that ours would be unique? So this whole thing is summed up in a wonderful quote by Abraham Lincoln. When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. And it was a moment of epiphany for me personally <clears throat> to realize a few years ago that that's my religion too. So perhaps I can get you all to think about your religion. Well, where are we going with this? The question is now, how do we value the future? Do we have an ethics of the future? Let's reflect for a moment. This is a sign in Santiago that my husband spotted and said, you've got to take a picture of it. There is more future than past. Now, probably, okay. <laughs> um, let's assume that's true. If we're utilitarians and we want to maximize the benefit for people, if not animals, and if there are more people in the future, then surely we should be putting a great deal of weight on preserving the future so that those people can thrive. But of course, the question is, how much do we value the future? Well, one quantitative indicator of that is the exponential discount rate, which determines the time value of money. If you're going to give me a dollar a year from now, according to standard economic thinking, I'm not going to let you give me a dollar. I'm going to make you give me a little bit extra. We call it interest or the time value of money. And the lowest possible discount rate in the American economy is that charged by the Federal Reserve to member banks. And here's an average over the last 50 years. It's 2%. So it says that something happening 2% from now, like a dollar, sorry, one year from now, is 2% less value to me than the same thing happening now. At a discount rate of 2% at age 20, you're valuing your retirement years at only one third the value of your current year. And at a discount rate of 2%, future generations farther into the future have essentially zero value, even though there may be a lot of them. I ask you personally, do you think you would want to value your retirement years at only one third the value of your current year? Does that make sense to you personally? I don't think so. Now, in, in practice, it turns out that in real life, people don't use an exponential discount rate. They use something called the hyperbolic discount rate, which actually uh, is a little bit skewed from exponential. It undervalues the near term and slightly overvalues the far term, but the net result is the same. The far term is undervalued and future generations just don't matter. And by the way, the exponential discount rate is what we're using these days to value uh, infrastructure investments or anything that we do in order to preserve nature. And the economic system is just set up from the get-go to make those things not worth doing. Well, why do we put up with this? And it's because we humans, this is now my, me speaking, we have a weak moral organ for the far future because having one was not necessary for our evolutionary success to this time. This is what the evolutionary biologists would tell us. Well, okay, so it seems to me that if we don't have any value for the future, the likelihood of our saving it is low. Is that really true? Is it really that hopeless? Uh, oops, sorry, I should have given the summary. There's no collective understanding of the origin of human ethics and its relation to planning Earth's future. That's my thing three. Well, here's some evidence that human beings actually do care about Earth's far future. If I were speaking in an auditorium and could see you all, I would give you a poll. And here's a hypothetical. Imagine Earth a thousand years from now. It is a smoking ruin and human actions starting with our generation are responsible. You're supposed to assume that. That's the hypothetical. And I ask you, is this good or bad? When I've given talks, 
I ask people to raise their hand, I'd say 95% of the people say it's bad. 2% sort of perversely say it's good. Some people are always a little perverse. They say it's good because actually there wouldn't be any human beings to interfere with Earth anymore, and that would be good. And then uh, roughly 3% don't know or don't care, whatever. But the point is that the vast majority, this is your reaction, it's my reaction, I bet it's yours, to contemplate an Earth in the not too distant future, a thousand years from now that's uninhabitable, is distasteful. And now I ask, well, why is that? Why do we care about it? And I'm, I've developed a theory, which I'm sharing with you and would love to get your reaction. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say this before. What is it that humans really care about? So I think what we really care about is low entropy and its creative possibilities. So I give you some examples. We feel awe and wonder at the complexity of Earth's biosphere. And it's so wonderful. It's so amazing. That's why every society, every civilization makes up its own creation myth to explain this. This is something that's important. It needs to be explained. We have creation myths. The losses that we mourn are always invariably increases in entropy. A person dies their atoms fall apart. A person drops a precious vase that has managed to survive, defying the rules of entropy for 4,000 years, they drop it. It's gone, we feel shock, we're, we're dismayed. This increase in entropy is, uh, is very disappointing. So my, pr my premise is that human beings understand intuitively how pro improbable Earth is, and therefore how precious it is. And I submit for consideration the notion that low entropy is actually the ultimate human value. We tend to incorporate and code our values into religions. So taking this thought one step further, do we need a new religion that worships Earth's spectacular ability to generate low entropy enclaves wherever more complex and beautiful phenomena can grow? And would such a religion help to focus our, our attentions and our emotions, really, on the need to preserve a future for our beautiful planet? Okay, so it's with these thoughts that we're trying to create an Earth Futures Institute at Santa Cruz. Here's part of the program. Uh, I would like to run Earth systems models showing Earth's long-term carrying capacity. Why do I care about this? Because if this is small, why do we bother? Exaggerating for a moment, supposing we showed that um, in long-term, cosmic term time, only uh, a thousand people could live, live well on planet Earth. Um, I myself would not envision, this is a value, going back and living very simply, living off the land the way a hunter-gatherer uh, civilization might have done so, and, and some still do, just because it's not interesting and it doesn't reflect the ultimate creative potential of our environment here. So I want complexity, I want novelty, I want new things, my, my personal values, and I think that takes a certain number of people or intelligent beings. So that's why I say, if I learned that the carrying capacity of Earth long-term was really small, I might give up. I might say, well, let's go out in a blaze of glory now. That's what we're doing. Uh, but on the other hand, in studying this, we might learn that there are important choke points and perhaps they can be worked. Anyway, I think this is a whole area of intellectual study that's worth our attention. The next point, I hope will be obvious, we need economic systems that don't depend on growth. And at the same time, we really need to understand our human beings, the cyclical nature of the societies that we tend to create. And we need to understand that there are instabilities that should be damped 
They can be studied quantitatively, I think, by studying uh, systems of equations, this factor K shouldn't be bigger than 10. I'll bet there's some basic principles there that any stable society will have to observe. And I would like to know what they are. I think we should discover them. And then the last thing is our moral compass for the future. I would like to know as an academic exercise where human values come from. And I'd like to teach people this from birth so that they know what it means to be human. In the process, we would find out whether human ethics can grow, is it malleable? And can we ultimately learn to live the earth enough to save it? So let me conclude here with a picture that I'm sure you've all seen. This is a picture of Saturn taken by Cassini looking back towards the sun. But what you might not realize is that it's also a picture of Earth. Hard to see. Give you a little help. That's Earth. Now, I know I'm speaking to astronomers, so you'll not be shocked. But when this picture is shown to lay audiences, there's a gasp. Uh, the thought that, my God, even in our solar system, Earth looks so insignificant. And it's, it's a moment very much like that despair poster that I showed you a moment ago, astronomy finding out that you really just don't matter. But I hope I've um, successfully communicated the message that Earth is amazing. And if complexity, well, we haven't found anything else in the universe that's remotely as interesting or complex or creative as our planet here. And furthermore, that it might be very, very rare. Perhaps this knowledge will help to inspire this generation of human beings to take the future seriously. And the message then would be astronomy inspiring us to save Earth. So I'll stop there and hope that I've inspired some good questions and a good discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andy. That was absolutely fantastic. Very, very thought provoking. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I would see you as a futurist. Would you accept that as a label? Yes, sure. So there are a lot of futurists around, though, aren't there? I mean, there's a lot of a lot of them. The books on futurist thinking and scientists, sci trained scientists and sociologists and so forth. And I'm just wondering. Do you have a gathering where you meet with other futurists and do they see economy as the key issue or is it population explosion? You know, I agree that resource consumption and economics is very important, but, you know, Malthus told us about the impact of populations and yeah. they're still on the rise. Yeah, they, they go together. Regardless of what we consume in a sense, just, just the, the sheer fact of having more people. So. Sure. When you meet with other, do you, have, do you have conventions where you get to meet with other futurists and do they see the same themes that you do? Uh, no, we don't have conventions because we've had a pandemic for two years and I've not oh, been course. in it that long, right? What I do is um, mainly I listen to people giving their own YouTube lectures mm. and I infer from that. Um, my, um, I think there's a great deal of consensus. I, I think uh, there are... There's a class of people, the doom and gloom people of which I am a member, um, that are really concerned with near term as well as long term. Yeah. And uh, th they differ as to what is going to kill us first. Some people say growth, some people say pollution, some people say um, the end of economic growth, because what that will do is it will kill the economy. And then there's a fringe of techno people who are worrying about drones and uh, web, uh, you know, and AI can turning, uh, controlling weapons and so on. There's a whole spectrum, uh, but I would identify most with really basics. How are we going to eat? 
How are we going to stay warm? What is the end of uh, cheap oil going to do to us? Yeah. And this is all going to happen within 30 or 40 years. And the question is, is it going to be a smooth downward transition or is it going to be uh, a collapse of some kind? And this is where I think if academics came together, as you say, futurists working together, maybe we could work out scenarios in a more quantitative way. And here's the point, look for danger signs. I, you know, what, what, what does the world need to be noticing that um, you really have to take seriously? Yeah. So my dream, I know you have to go, but I'll just say two more words. My, you've heard of the Cavley Institute, perhaps, here at Santa Barbara. I'd like to institute the same thing for futurists. And the Cavley that's distinctive, people come together for long conferences that last a quarter, or maybe six months or something like that. And it's very interdisciplinary. You look at a problem from many different angles. I think that would be a perfect venue in which academics could pursue um, helpful studies of the future in a setting like that. Uh, Sandy, uh, a beautiful talk, and I just wanted to say, even the evolution of the universe, which we and you know very well, you framed it so beautifully. Uh, I really liked that. Um, but I will, uh, you like controversy, so. I do, I'm gonna, please. I'm going to jump in. Okay. You, talk, you talked about, well, in the, uh, I'll start with your, you were concluding that it wouldn't be much fun if we only had a small number of people left and we had no science, innovation, creativity, new ideas. I think many of us would feel that as well. But I want to link that to what you said about exponential growth. You connected it to capitalism. Now, I am no fan of capitalism, so I don't like that. But people who have studied the evolution of science have concluded that science is only prospered when there is exponential growth in the science. Yeah, a huge problem. So how do we reconcile, since you thought about it, I, well, maybe for others, I will mention, you know, people like uh, philosophers of science, like the Solar Price, have pointed out, as a matter of fact, that most discoveries are made during periods where the field is growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> how do we reconcile having a productive science, but no exponential growth? I don't think we do. I think science is doomed as we know it. I don't think it's possible to reconcile, Ron. Okay. I, I totally agree with that conclusion. And it's sobering. It's very sobering. But you can already see it. We can't build any bigger telescopes. You know, we're totally maxed out. The society can't pay for it. Oh, um, big and small, that was in fact... Had always, has always been argued in the past and has never been true. Um, maybe the earth can't stand it. It's not that society can't afford it. Okay. Um, given that there are, you know, 50 other sciences also trying to feed at the, at the feeding trough, it's... Okay. Yeah. No, but so, you, I, you've raised a really good question. I'm going to actually expand on it because I'm trying to be um, uh, controversial. I'll expand on it by saying that I don't think it's any action, a, accident that the ideas of the Enlightenment with personal freedom, fulfillment, and progress originated right about the same time as the steam engine. And I am worried that our whole notion of democracy actually, in a subtle way, is premised on growth. Yes. Good questions to think about. Oh, I, I think the, I think the idea of growth is um, it's almost it's the elephant in the room that is shaping everything, and when it goes away, we have no idea how important that's going to be and how different things are going to be. Paul, uh, yeah, ninety-five percent of people don't want the Earth to be be destroyed, which is a perfectly reasonable and rational response right um i don't think it's rational i think it's emotional well i actually i think i think you're right there but the the, the th thing i was wondering about with that is that you could ask the same question about in a hundred years time and relate it to something to do with climate change and it would still make sense you don't want the earth to be a mess 
but there's clearly a, a some very severe cognitive dissonance between that statement of not wanting the earth to be a mess and actually the population acting on it and so and it's such a vast separation compared to the evidence of what's going on mm -hmm. I, I don't know what your thoughts are about how we get around that sort of problem i that's why i was driven to the thought that we need a new religion religion compels people to do things you know and uh it does have a certain moral force that is stronger than just saying you should or you should not you know you have to it has to be marshaled and allied with the opprobrium and approval of society. It takes a moral machine, in other words, to enforce um, and inculcate values like that. And by asking, is our moral system malleable? What I'm really asking is, is it capable of absorbing a whole new orientation, which up to now we haven't had? And I do note that I think we are capable of changing our minds on pretty fundamental things. For example, slavery. You know, that that's a, an enormous change in point of view. Or women's rights or transgendered rights. We, we have changed our notion of value of things, in this particular case, people, classes of people, profoundly. Can we also, are we capable of changing the way in which and the amount degree to which we value our planet would be. And another way of looking at that is that the, the changes that I just described could be described as an ability to bring more people into our tent. If somebody's in your tent, then they're part of you, 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 you defend them, you, you care for them. And it's always in our ethics, I think, the self versus the other. Can we bring future generations into our tent today and think of them as ourselves? Up to now, we don't. But I'm just asking the question that way. Yes. Okay. I, I, yeah, go ahead. We'll address that. We, a lot of our problems are due to the overpopulation and the pressures of many the world where the world's going uh our, our whole climate problem there i just like to hear sandy's uh, opinion of that well um if you look at the increase in world gdp it's about three percent for the last 50 years per year and world population increase has been one and a half percent so half of the greater demand on the environment roughly speaking is is coming from more people and half is coming from the fact that the people we have are consuming more. If these things were in the ratio of 10 to 1, I think we could afford to focus on one or the other, but they're not. They're, they're really of comparable size and they, they both have to be addressed. Uh, it's for sure true. There's no way over the long term that this planet can support 7 billion people living the way we do today. We are in profound overshoot. So uh, something is definitely going to change and there are going to be fewer people. And the question is, are they going to live much worse? They might. Low entropy just of itself is maybe not a goal, but um, great work you're doing. I think it's fantastic. Okay. But, you know, low ent entropy is very low on an airplane. Why, why is that? Because we're using airplanes to maximum efficiency and there's no margin for bad behavior or empty seats or any of those things. Using the analogy between an airplane and a limited planet, I think it's inevitable that entropy in the form of government regulations and social uh, social regulations is going to act to decrease lower entropy in the society. That is true if you want to maximize the number of people you have. And I personally would, but of course that's part of the value conversation that we need to have. If you only want two people, then their individual entropy can be very high. Um, so Simon asks, 
I think one of your slides, Sandy, you had um, your 17 points for um, necessary in your, your Drake equation. Um, so Simon asked whether a magnetic field was really necessary. You know, perhaps a sufficiently thick atmosphere can attenuate all the harmful radiation, which could otherwise destroy life on the planet. Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent point. Could, could very well. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, that leads to another question. My question is, could you have science on a planet with a thick atmosphere? And what would it look like? And this this raises the <laughs> I'm I'm fond of asking all these questions these days. It raises the question of to what extent is our very notion of science and universal law predicated on the fact that we can see the rest of the universe? Because astronomy played such an enormous role in teaching people that there were large scale regularities bigger than ourselves. Uh, so. I, I, that's an interesting question too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Great. Um, so if there's no one else with a last minute question, uh, I think I can speak for everybody here when I just say thank you very much for coming to join us and yeah, um, deliver such a fascinating talk. And um, yeah, we hope to have you back. We hope, well, we hope to have people visiting a Sydney Earth Futures Institute in the future and um, yeah, perhaps come to California for your, to join your Kavli style institute. Okay, thanks Sam. Yeah. Um, thanks very much again. Wonderful being with you all today. I've really enjoyed it. Bye. Uh, well, I found that fascinating. I thought that was uh, very good. There's a lot of stuff to think about. And uh, now we get on to some astronomy uh, stuff for you to think about. So, Sky for the Munch from March 22 leading into uh, April 22. So, the year is disappearing a little bit quick. Anybody who's been looking up in the last few nights will realise there's not much planetary action in the evening. And that's because all the planets are at a meeting in the early morning. Oh, okay, I'm through. So a few of the highlights, uh, Neptune at conjunction on the 13th, so it's through there uh, now, one of the reasons you can't see it, uh, not that it's the uh, biggest object out there to have a look at. The meteor shower at the moment is the Gamma Norbit, uh, activated from 25th of the 2nd through to the 28th of the 3rd, the peak was actually last night, uh, around about 6 per hour, best viewed in the morning which uh, basically everything I'm going to say tonight is get up early in the morning if you want to see anything. Uh, a couple of comets about. Uh, comet Cal, Comet uh, Borel in there, uh, one in Percy's, and uh, one is actually in Orion. Uh, it's two degrees north of New Orionis. Uh, I'm not really sure which one is New Orionis. Uh, comet Pan Stars. Uh, I'll go into the comets a little bit uh, later on as well. Oh, Scorpio starts to come up, 
There's a few open clusters in Scorpio and a couple of globular clusters as well. So something to look forward to. Uh, over the other side, still have the tarantula nebula. 47 to come. 47 Tucano there, and you've got the Medicentauri up there, and you've got a couple of globular clusters. Both are actually quite easy to find. Uh, 47 might be getting a little bit low on the horizon at the moment, but certainly uh, Medicentauri as well up there. And looking to the north, uh, basically the main one there obviously is Orion. Uh, heading more towards the western horizon now, so uh, Ryan will start to disappear over the next few months. So if you want to get some shots or have a good look at the uh, nebula, now's the chance. Uh, and the one everyone wants to have a crack at is the, the Horsehead Nebula at the moment. So uh, that's uh, just a bit about there. Uh, it goes to Jupiter up there. That's an interesting one. It's a planetary nebula. And when you look at it, it looks like a, a slightly faded Jupiter, about the same shape as Jupiter. It's actually a star that's floated, well not floated, but it's given off its, uh, struck down, given off its outer thing, it's collapsing and going, becoming a white dwarf. So what you're actually looking at is the emission from the star. The planets, uh, as I said, uh, Mercury has just gone through superior conjunction, sorry, moving into superior conjunction on the other side of the sun. So uh, after that, it will become a morning object and it will actually be fairly close to both Saturn and Jupiter. So for those who want to get up around about 5, 6 a.m., uh, you're actually going to be able to see most of the planets in one part of the sky. They're all, uh, four of them will actually be within Capricorn. Because they're planets, they're all visible, they actually all stand out uh, most of the time. Venus, uh, as I said, reaching maximum elongation uh, this month, and uh, so it's as high as it's going to get. Uh, early morning object once again. It does have a couple of close encounters with Saturn and Mars, and uh, you know, if you can be bothered, it is worth getting up to maybe have a look at it. Earth reaches autumn equinox on the 21st, uh, so after that, and more night to, uh, to actually view the stars. Uh, Mars, getting a little higher in the morning now, uh, well through uh, conjunction, uh, it's moving into Capricorn and later on into Aquarius. But while it's in Capricorn, it has a close uh, encounter with Venus and Saturn. Uh, also, in fact, the moon in there too. So I'll be waiting. Uh, Jupiter, went into conjunction with the sun early in March, returned to the morning. Uh, twilight just before dawn and has a close encounter with Mercury on the 21st of this month, uh, about half an hour before sunrise. Saturn, uh, also a morning object, slightly ahead of uh, Jupiter, a little further ahead than it was uh, last year or the time it's gone. Uh, you will notice both Jupiter and Saturn get a little bit further apart in the sky. That's because Jupiter is actually moving a faster. Uranus still in Aries. Um, probably too low on the horizon to see now. Difficult enough to see that it's in a good spot with uh, no other interference. And Neptune on the 13th is in conjunction, so uh, you can give up on that one as well. Planetary appearance. I really don't know why they put uh, Uranus and Neptune there. You've, you've got buckets of uh, seeing them uh, at the moment. Uh, Venus, you're looking at half, and that's because it's actually out to the side of the sun, as far as it gets, so you're looking at the one half is lit, the other half isn't, well, just like the over. Uh, Mercury, moving into superior conjunction later on in the month there, if you could see it from the sun, you would see both of its face, because the face facing this would be the lit bit. Mars, uh, early morning object, uh, still has that little uh, shadow bit at the back there because it is still on the relative to us around the other side of the sun. Uh, it will get higher and higher as, uh, as time goes by and probably around about the middle of the year to uh, July, August, it will actually start to uh, return to the evening sky after its usual two year absence. Uh, Saturn, uh, 
basically a sector that still has its rings tilted towards us, but in 2025 we'll actually pass through the ring plane. So what you're going to see with SAP is the rings will gradually close over the next couple of years. And then as we pass through the ring plane, it will actually start to open and we'll be looking at the money. And uh, it's interesting if you, if you really think about the, the orbital aspects that cause that. Question, Mark. I'm just yep. curious, the, the three images of Mercury there, why did, why did I, it yeah, increase, I, I agree increase the shadow and then, then yeah, lose it? I agree. Yeah. I'm not really sure what it is. That's why I went straight to the It goes around solid out for four months, so, 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 if, so, if so in a seen, month it's only going to do about a quarter of an orbit, isn't it? Yeah, I would have actually thought the shadow would be the earlier I would have thought the other two would be the other way around. Yeah, anyway. yeah I agree. <laughs> I think they've got them. Uh, 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 so mm. um, I, th I think they have actually, because if you look at that one slightly it's bigger, bigger as well, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think those two need to be swapped. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not that it really matters. If you put a telescope on Mercury, <laughs> you're not really going to be a lot. <laughs> okay, the other stuff. Five uh, comets. None of them in a really good position to be in. Um, comet needed. Uh, the one that uh, was so prominent before Christmas, it's now moved into microscopium in the uh, southeastern sky and is now fading to about 12 magnitude. So you still see it, but uh, it's not, uh, not as good as it was. Comet Borrelly, uh, it's past perihelion, basically means it's gone as close to the sun as it's going to go and it's now heading back to its home in the York Mount. And uh, it's fading to 10 magnitude. So as you can gather, Human eye can see to about fifth magnitude, so these comets are not really bright. They are telescope objects. Pan stars uh, may brighten the ninth magnitude, but <coughs> still pan in the pre dawn sky. So it's, it's really worth getting up before the sun rises at the moment if you want to actually see some stuff. Comet Atlas, uh, visible for most of the night in Gemini, but it's around about 11th magnitude, and it's fairly low on the northern horizon. Uh, you usually pick Gemini by the two uh, twin stars, uh, Casper and Bollocks, uh, which are fairly obvious once you actually look forward. And Comet Cop in Capricorn, uh, it's about 10 degrees above the eastern morning uh, horizon, and unlikely to brighten any brighter than 11 magnitude. And as I said before, the uh, only media show active at the moment is the Gavin Roberts. Um, they've been active since the 25th of the second and finish up towards the end of this month. Their peak was last night, but if we were to go out there tomorrow morning, best time to observe it. So it sounds like everyone's getting up really early if they want to do some astronomy. Um, uh, yeah, best view just before dawn. Righto. Now because there's nothing in the sky or planetary in the sky to look at, but I'm going to have a little look at Eta Carinae. Probably heard it uh, spoken of many times. People, uh, particularly newer photographers, like to have a crack at it because it is quite an obvious one up there. But what are we actually looking at? Eta Carinae, or Eta Carina, is, uh, because it's actually in the Carina, is, is a star uh, in this little patch here, this little bright patch. Yeah, anyone on Facebook would have seen a picture that Nick Nax put on Facebook yesterday showing the, uh, the Carina and actually if you pull it out and expand it you can see a lot of the stuff in his photograph. Okay, so this little this square here is, a, is up here at the moment and Eta Carinae is a star there. Now, Eta Carinae is a super massive star, about 120 times the mass of the sun. And back in 1842, I think it was, it actually, it's a variable star. Back in 1842, it expanded very rapidly from about 7th magnitude up to about minus 1 magnitude. So, second brightest object in the sky. And when it did that, it actually shed a considerable amount of its, its mass. And it formed this little thing called the homunculus nebula. Now what the homunculus nebula is, is actually the, the material that was shed from the star Peter Carinae. It then faded back to 7th magnitude, 
And apparently since the 1960s it's been brightening again and it's up to about 4 feet to now. Now, if you were to actually put a telescope on it, the homunculus nebula is very difficult to see because it's quite small. And if you actually look at a get a decent picture of Eta Carinae and have a look at it, you'll notice that the star itself is a bit fuzzy. And the reason it's fuzzy is because that's what it actually looks like. So, alright, so if you get the telescope on it, and you can't quite focus it, that's why. Next to it is this black patch here, which is the deep hole nebula. Now that's a dark nebula that's actually in front of where the star is, uh, is central to. And if you look at that picture that Nick Nat's put on Facebook, which we know it's, if you actually expand that, that the central bit there, you'll pick the keyhole nebula quite easily. Now it's a little bit bigger than, uh, than the homunculus nebula, and it's not quite as defined as it used to be, because Beta Carinae is part of a, a group of, of supermassive stars. So that nebula formed a lot of really big ones. And of course they give off a lot of ionising radiation, which uh, obviously affects the nebula around the keyhole. So apparently it's not quite as defined as when it was first discovered in the 1800s, or first defined in the 1800s. Uh, it's part of, you'll see up the top there, Trumpler 14. Where Beta Carinae is, and the supermassive, or a bunch of supermassive stars, it's called Trumpler 16. Okay, that can remember it, that remember it is. Okay, and then around it, you've basically got the nebula there, and I think if you look at that picture, you'll see that. Pick that bit out in it. Oh, you did. It's a bit of the key hole. Oh. Okay, so that's all around there. So you've got that, but around this area, this is this is in the Milky Way. Okay, so it's got a lot of a lot of star activity, and some of the more interesting things. Uh, this here, this point here, and this one here, and this one here. And you probably didn't memorise all of it. So that is the next part. So Eta Carinae, supermassive star, uh, suffered a massive eruption in 1842, which created the homunculus nebula. But the star itself, or the nebula, eight and a half thousand light years away from us. It's uh, in the Carina, Sagittarius Arm and Milky Way, and contains star clusters, bright and dark nebulas, and it's about four times the size of the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is about 30 light years across. So that little thing in the sword of Orion, that's 30 light years from one side to the other. This is four times bigger. The Homunculus Nebula, two little fuzzy lobes, you need a fairly sizable telescope or a really good picture of it. Um, due to the 1842 eruption, we could shed some of its mass. Uh, you will see because of its small size. The keyhole nebula, we've already covered that one. Trumpler 14, I'll we'll go back. Trumpler 14, which is up the top here, so I think about here. And that is uh, a seventh magnitude from, uh, cluster of uh, compact cluster, so a virtual globular cluster in amongst the uh, nebula itself. So obviously it's going to illuminate it quite, quite bright. One of the youngest clusters, it's only half a, half a million years old, so um, you know, you want to see something young <laughs> in, in astronomy? That's one of the youngest, apparently. Some of the other stuff, NGC 3532, so 3532 is up here. Mm. Well, too far back. It's known as the Firefly Party Cluster. It's about a hundred uh, little stars. And eight night magnitude. If you actually put a telescope on it, it just looks like a globular cluster that just started to separate. Uh, quite, quite spectacular when you see it. And in actual fact, a pair of binoculars is probably the best thing that you look at it with. Uh, it is visible to the naked eye. Uh, and it, uh, it's mostly white stars, but it does have a couple of uh, a couple of little red ones. EDC 3492, uh, it's in a condensed region. Yeah. Yeah. That one is uh, 3 2 
side of this, that one there with that we talked about. Very small stars, it's in a, in a fairly tight cluster as well, not quite as bright as uh, 3 by 3 2. Uh, 3114, open uh, cluster appearing as a cloudy patch. It's around fourth magnitude, but it's a collection of sixth to seventh magnitude stars. So once again, the cluster, I think it's starting to break up a little bit too. So it's sort of an open globular cluster, if you like. And the last one, known as a gem cluster, it resembles a cut diamond. It consists of 40 blue white stars. And I don't know who counted them because they're all pretty close together. Uh, it's in a rough square shape and it has a 7th magnitude orange star on one edge. Now, I haven't personally seen that, but that's this one up here. And you can see it's quite a tight little cluster in a, a very bright square. It's actually outside big fish. All right. So, might not be any planets, but there's certainly some other stuff up there to have a good look at and uh, have a bit of a play and try and find. Information was all provided by Astronomy 2022. Simon's buzzed off, so I can't check with him if there's any left. Well, I assume most of you have probably really want one and got one. And uh, that's it. Any questions? Thanks, <laughs> 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 Matt. No worries. After a 1.5 million kilometer journey, the James Webb Space Telescope has arrived at the Sun-Earth L2 point. It did this by executing its final mid-course correction burn called MCC2. It lasted just 297 seconds or a little less than five minutes. And it only changed Webb's speed by about one and a half meters per second. That's a brisk walking pace. It may not seem like much, but it was enough to place Webb into an orbit around L2. In fact, it placed it into a very large orbit, one that's more than twice as large as the Moon's orbit around Earth. It'll take Webb about six months to complete a single orbit around L2, and this first go-around is jam-packed with mirror alignments, phasing, instrument calibrations, moving target tracking tests, verifications, station-keeping maneuvers, and finally, the first science observations. But what exactly is so special about L2? I mean, it's just a point in space. And it's an empty point in space at that, so how can Webb orbit something that isn't there? Well, it is true that L2 is empty, but orbiting empty points in space is actually very common. And that's because whenever there are two massive bodies that are orbiting each other, they both orbit a common center of mass, or barycenter. If the objects are massive enough, the center of mass lies somewhere in between. We only say that the Moon orbits Earth because its center of mass is located inside Earth. But Pluto and Charon have similar masses, so their barycenter is somewhere in the space between them. So the fact that something can orbit an empty point in space really isn't all that unusual. But at the same time, that's a two-body system. It doesn't explain how Webb can orbit a point that's outside of another two-body system. Well, the good news is that we can break this problem down and understand just what the L2 point is and how Webb can orbit around it. In fact, there are many spacecraft that have orbited L2, such as NASA's WMAP satellite and ESA's Planck and Herschel telescopes, and Russia's Spectre RG and ESA's Gaia spacecraft are both orbiting there today. L2 is one of the five Lagrangian points between the Sun and Earth. Actually, these five points exist around any two-body system. So, there are Lagrangian points for the Earth-Moon system, a set of points for the Sun-Jupiter system, and so on. Now, if a third object is placed at any of these points, the gravitational forces of the two large bodies combine in such a way that holds the third object stable with respect to the others. The practical upshot is that as the system orbits, the third body tags along. 
And that's why the Sun-Earth L1 point is a great place to position sun-facing missions like the Solar Heliospheric Observatory and Earth-facing missions like Discover. Likewise, L2 is the place to put astrophysics missions like Gaia and Webb. At both locations, spacecraft maintain a constant line-of-sight communication with Earth, even as Earth orbits the Sun. But L2 is particularly important for Webb because it can block the heat of the Sun, Earth, and Moon with a single sunshield. That's a perfect place for infrared astronomy. But there are some important caveats. For one thing, the third object has to have a mass that's really, really, really small relative to the larger bodies. Now, obviously, that's not a problem. Webb's mass is negligible compared to Earth, let alone the Sun. But the other caveat is that the Lagrangian points are at best described as metastable, especially the first three points. To understand what I mean, imagine a saddle that's perfectly smooth and frictionless. Now imagine trying to balance a marble in the very center of the saddle. It's theoretically possible, but as a practical matter, it's extremely hard to do. The L2 point is a lot like this. An object moving perpendicular to the Sun-Earth line falls toward the center, but then it either falls toward or away from Earth. Now, if Webb falls away from Earth, it's really in trouble because the only way to bring it back would be to turn it around and thrust back. But that would cause the telescope to suddenly warm up, all of the structures would expand, glues and adhesives would melt, and the mission would be over. And that's bad. Webb has thrusters only on the warm, sun-facing side of the observatory. And that's because hot thrusters would contaminate the cold telescope side with heat or with rocket exhaust that would otherwise condense on the optics. And that would also be bad. A safer approach is to place Webb almost, but not quite at L2. And that way, when it falls back toward Earth, a tiny thruster burn pushes it back almost, but not quite back to L2. And this means Webb never runs the risk of actually falling beyond L2 where it cannot be recovered. And that's why the Ariane 5 launch was intentionally designed to slightly undershoot and let the spacecraft do a series of mid-course correction burns. The first two, MCC-1A and MCC-1B, were executed on the way out to L2. However, arriving even just shy of L2 leaves us with another problem. At that distance, the Sun is in a permanent annular eclipse by Earth. Webb is solar-powered. Now, it could use nuclear power, but that's expensive and hard to do. Another complication is that Coriolis forces would cause Webb to librate around L2. In other words, Webb would find itself in a tiny orbit around L2 that would need even more thruster burns to manage. Oh, and the moon's gravity on Webb is also still a thing, and it's constantly varying as it orbits Earth. It turns out that these real-world complications can be addressed by simply taking up a large orbit around L2. But how is it possible to orbit something that isn't there? I mean, L2 is still an empty point in space. Well, to help us understand better, let's look at the problem by considering some of the forces acting on Webb. If Webb were actually at L2, it would be feeling gravitational forces from the Sun and from Earth. So let's draw them separately so that we can keep track of them. Now Webb is orbiting the Sun at the same time, so we can also imagine a centrifugal force pulling Webb in the opposite direction. Now the great thing about L2 is that at this distance, the centrifugal force is exactly balanced by the gravity of the Earth and Sun. Now, you may have heard that there's no such thing as a centrifugal force, and that is correct. But we are talking about a rotating non-inertial frame here, so centrifugal forces are still a useful way of summarizing all of the real effects that are going on. Oh, and we're not going to worry about the gravitational effects of the moon, or even the fact that the sun and the earth are not point sources. We're just going to keep everything simple for the time being. Now, let's move Webb up some distance away from L2. Now, the gravitational force from the Sun changes a tiny amount, but not very much because it's over 150 million kilometers away. But Earth is just 1% of that distance, so its gravity changes considerably. Because Webb is now farther away from Earth, its gravitational pull gets weaker. 
It's also no longer parallel with the sun's direction either. So let's break it up into its X and Y components. Now we can really see the problem. The centrifugal force is in the X direction of our diagram, but it's actually greater than the gravitational forces from the sun and earth. That means Webb is going to drift both down and farther away from L2. So we need to fix this drift in both the X and Y directions. First, we bring Webb a little closer to Earth so that it's now hovering above a new point that we'll just call L2 prime. Earth's gravity gets stronger and its X component helps to balance the centrifugal force once again. But the Y component has gotten stronger as well, so Webb wants to move downward. But the closer it gets to the Sun-Earth line, the stronger Earth's gravity gets and the more it moves toward Earth. We can't let that happen either, because then the heat load would become too strong for the Sun Shield to handle. However, we can counteract this downward force by giving Webb a sideways push into the screen. This sets up a new centrifugal force that balances the downward force of Earth's gravity. When combined with the sideways motion, Webb takes up a new circular halo orbit around L2 prime. And that means there doesn't have to be a physical mass at L2 prime in order to attract Webb. Rather, Webb is simply being pulled by the Y component of Earth's gravitational force. Now, this is an oversimplified discussion of Webb's orbit around L2. We deliberately ignored real-world complications in order to understand how Webb can orbit something that isn't there. But getting into Webb's actual orbit required taking all of these real-world complications into account. So to make things easier, Webb wasn't actually launched to L2. Instead, it was launched to a point along the side of L2. As it was starting to fall away, Webb executed its MCC2 burn to settle into its orbit. Since part of this initial fall was directed in the X direction toward Earth, the burn propelled Webb into an orbit that's now tilted by about 33 degrees. The orbit isn't perfectly circular either, but rather follows an elliptical shape. As a result, Webb's distance from the L2 point varies between 250,000 kilometers and 832,000 kilometers. Now, for reference, the Moon's semi-major axis is about 400,000 kilometers. So Webb's orbit around L2 is enormous. Now, this large orbit was chosen because it makes getting to L2 a lot easier. The farther something is from its orbital focus, the slower it moves and the less energy is required to maneuver. And that's why it only took a five minute burn and a 1.5 meter per second delta V. The large orbit also means that Webb will never drift into the shadows of the Earth or the Moon during its mission. However, larger orbits can permit stray light from the Earth or Moon to get past the Sun Shield and reach the primary or secondary mirrors. In addition, a larger orbit can reduce the number of communication opportunities with the deep space network. That's why Webb will have to change its orientation to keep stray light off the mirrors at all times throughout its orbit and schedule the communication downlinks accordingly. The Webb takes about six months to complete one orbit around L2. Although it sometimes flies out just a little bit past this point, the geometric center of the orbit is still centered on the L2 prime point on the Earth side. Remember, we don't want that ball right at the very middle of the saddle. That's why Webb will execute small station-keeping burns every now and then to maintain its orbit. Missions like Gaia only require three to four of these burns every year. But Webb will require much more frequent burns for a couple of reasons. For one, its sun shield is always feeling a torque from solar radiation pressure. Webb can counter this rotational force by spinning up its reaction wheels, but the solar radiation pressure is unrelenting, so the reaction wheels must increase their spin over time. Eventually, a station-keeping burn is required to rotate Webb back into place and let the wheels throttle back. Webb also changes its orientation as it points from one position to the other. All of these motions perturb Webb's orbit ever so slightly, requiring more station-keeping burns to maintain. And that's why Webb executes a burn once every 21 days. 
The exact timing and duration of those burns are calculated by the Flight Dynamics team at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. They'll do this by monitoring Webb's telemetry data and using ranging data from the Deep Space Network to pinpoint Webb's location and its motion at all times. They even take into account gravitational perturbations from the Moon and even the gravitational perturbations of the rest of the planets. So yeah, the Flight Dynamics team are really awesome, and they've got their work cut out for them over the next 20 years. The first one comes from um, Christian Lazar, and he's asked, how do astronauts prevent colds or flus on the ISS, and what kind of remedies do you have? Do you bring your own medication? How does it work? Well, first of all, colds and flus are either of a bacteriological origin or vi viral origin. So the first and foremost way of preventing it from happening is the quarantine. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why astronauts, before going to the space station, stay up to 21 days se uh, separated from you know, the general carriers of, of uh, bacteria and uh, viruses, which is children, general population. We are usually segregated with a small group of people that, that are checked and uh, in a way they are in quarantine with us. Mm -hmm. And then right before we go, in, we go to space, we actually go through a prophylactic uh, procedure that tries to lower the risk, as, minimize the risk as much as possible. And then on the space station, we, we try to keep it um, a very aseptic environment so that in theory, we shouldn't have viral agents uh, uh, traveling around. And after a couple of weeks, really, we all share the same bacteria. Mm -hmm. So those kind of, uh, the, that, that also lowers the risk of uh, infections and so on. If something should happen, depending on the gravity of it, we have, oh, by the way, that is, that's a joke there, yeah. the gravity <laughs> of it. Depending how, on, on how serious it is, uh, we have a small pharmacy, small, but lots of different antibiotics or medicine that you can find off the shelf or even more serious things that we can take with the support of, uh, of the medical staff on the ground. If we have a doctor on board, which we had, uh, Drew Morgan is a doctor, mm -hmm. we can also use him and his expertise to, you know, for small maladies and things like that. And if something really serious should happen, we can, we can always come back to the ground within a few hours. Every day we have, um, we have times that we can undock, turn on the engines, come back to the ground. If something really, really serious were to happen in less than a day, you can be in a, in a perfectly functional hospital on the ground. So we've said a lot about light. It turns out that light's actually only one of the waves in the same spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, what else is in that spectrum? I have here a model which shows us. Here we have light in the centre. This is frequency going along here, number of oscillations per second. As we go up in frequency, we get ultraviolet. Well, that's what makes us go brown, or in my case, red in the sun. And if I go up further in frequency, we see x-rays. Very high frequency, very short pulses, can see things within the body. Still further, we have cosmic rays and gamma rays. If I go down in frequency, we have infrared, which actually we know as heat, and radio waves. There are also television waves, waves from mobile phones. They're all part of the same spectrum. They're all the same waves. They all travel at the same speed. And that speed is the speed of light. That speed's very special. I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. But first of all, we're going to have a go at measuring the speed of light. And I need a volunteer to help me. Could you come up, please? And your name is? Helen. Helen. Could you come and stand here, Helen, while they bring on the speed of light measuring equipment? Let's just stand out of the way. Helen, just come around this side. Because, Helen, you're going to be data collector. And this is the data we need. We need the wavelength 
and the frequency of the light. Because we need to multiply these two together. Are you good at multiplying, Helen? Not too bad. Not too bad, okay. Always got the calculator here. That will give the speed. Okay? So let's start measuring the wavelength. What do we need to measure the wavelength of light? A microwave and a dish of marshmallows. And here they are, arranged in a line, and we're going to bung them in the microwave and cook them. Okay? So let's just close the door. Now don't try this at home. Now what's going to happen to these marshmallows? Well, they're going to cook. But they're actually not going to cook evenly. Microwave ovens, particularly if you've turned off the rotating table, don't cook evenly. And what happens is, if you remember back to the wave machine, when there was a wall and we sent a wave against the wall, we set up a standing wave, a wave that didn't move anywhere. It just stood still. Well, that's our key for measuring the wavelength. Because in the points where the wave is actually moving up and down a lot, there has a lot of energy there. And so there, the marshmallows should actually melt first. So let's have a look, Helen. Let's take out these marshmallows. And yes, we have a look at them. You see, some of them have melted, others haven't. Then they've melted, others haven't. And there's actually a pattern. So just like on this card here, if we take this point as the point where the marshmallows have melted, and this point, it will actually give us a measure of half the wavelength. So let's do that, Helen. Let's close that door. Let's take out a tape measure. Oh, we have a ruler here. And Helen, if you'd just like to help me measure the distance, we need the separation of these two melted bits. Six. About six. Okay, so that's half of the wavelength. So six centimetres. So Helen, if you could write down here, 12 centimetres as the wavelength. <coughs> that's right, just write centimetres here. That's great. Now we need the frequency. Frequency is on the back. Come around and have a look with me. <laughs> Come and have a look here. It says 2450 megahertz. Now, megahertz is a million hertz, a million oscillations per second. So let's write down 2450. Now we need to put a million after it, so it's six zeros. That's great. Now we need to just multiply these things two together. Except we should really convert this into meters, because this is oscillations per second times we'd like it to be meters. So let's turn 12 centimeters into 0.12 meters. And we've got to multiply these two numbers together. Well, let's put an equal sign here. And right down here, six zeros, so we take care of the zeros. OK. And now, I want you, Helen, to multiply 0.12 by 2450. That gives 294. <coughs> so let's put in some commas here, because I can never read these things with all those zeros. There we go. So what we've got is 294 million meters per second. And here we have the number that physicists use for the speed of light. And it is 300 million meters per second. So you've measured the speed of light. Thank you very much, Helen.